today is Pentecost Sunday and celebrate as such, and I want to go there. So if you have your Bible, would you open it to the book of Acts? We're going to go right into the Advent of the New Testament church and take a look at what God has to say today. Amen? By looking back at what he did and what he promises to do, um, we, get a, we get assurance that way from God that he knows, he knows his stuff. So here we have um, believers that had followed Christ. Jesus has died. They've witnessed his death. They've witnessed his, his burial. And um, they've also experienced now seeing him at his resurrection. Scripture says that um, they all witnessed him. And at one point, he was seen by over 500 people at one time. And he was around for 40 days, appearing in and out before he ascended to heaven. And then he gives them this commission, really, this, this command. And here we find ourselves in Acts. So in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, While he was staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. Catch that word. Say promise with me. Promise. The promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when, he had come, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you, do, will you at this time restore your kingdom to Israel? He, they were still looking for an earthly king to establish a political presence and power. And that's what the Jews are looking for today. Verse number seven, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that my father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive what power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now jump with me to Acts chapter two. So they gathered together on the day of Pentecost and this is what happened. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. At this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered i mean they were running toward the scene right it's like something happened this morning uh, we had a person come in the church and called 911 from the church phone and and so the police showed up and and i was up here in rehearsal and and uh, security was out there and and they were going like what is the police doing here right but they all came rushing they want something happened and so they're all coming to see what's going on in verse 7, they were amazed and astonished at all these speaking Galileans. How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Ferga and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. This account in history is one of the most foundational ideals for a Pentecostal experience or a Pentecostal church. The Pentecostal church is just a reflection of what Jesus has done. A Pentecostal believer is a reflection of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives. This, I want to spend some time unpacking some key things here in, in the scripture. And the first thing, let's just deal with some of it right now, is tongues. So the Bible says they all spoke with tongues and people have questions about speaking in tongues and, and it's pretty radical for today's day. Some might say, I don't think it so much, but um, they, uh, some people were saying, as some people say today, aren't these people just out of control? I mean, aren't they drunk? It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, how can they be drunk? This is ridiculous. They're just out of control. There are those that criticize it, but yet the Bible gives so much instruction and correction concerning tongues and encouragement about tongues. 
And I want to talk about just a few of those things because tongues isn't the focus here. I don't want us to get lost in it. The, pri the priority is seeking Jesus for baptism in the Holy Spirit. So first of all, the practice of praying in the Spirit is a private thing that the Holy Spirit, I believe, gives to believers. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray when we can't put it into words. Look at Paul's words in Romans 8, verse 26. He says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with the will. Uh, with, accordance with God's will. So we pray in tongues. We are, when, we, when we pray in tongues, we are encouraged. In fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 14, for that he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. We understand this, that, that praying in, in tongues has this purpose. And so when, when there is this experience that I know that God has for you as a believer. If you know Jesus, it's, it's not for people that don't know Jesus, right? It's the gift of God to those who are believers, that those who are believers can pray in tongues and God understands and hears by the power of the presence of his Holy Spirit. So that's one, the practice of praying in private. Number two there's this thing that Paul brings to the attention of the Corinthian church and much correction about the gift of tongues and interpretation. And the scripture has a lot to say about this. And now, now we're getting to the territory where some, if you haven't been in a Pentecostal church or in a charismatic experience, I should say in modern lingo today, that, Pastor, you know, this is where it's going to kind of get weird now. You lost me. This is, well, if that's abnormal then, and God is normal, then I'd rather be abnormal, Right? God is normal, so uh, I'm going for God's normal, and we would all agree that in the church we have seen this kind of stuff abused and misused and, and thrown around and sold for money. It's been manipulated, right? Um, 1 Corinthians 14, and we're getting there in our 1 Corinthians series here in not a couple of months, not within a couple of months here, but... He says, and Paul gives correction in, in chapter 14, let him who speaks in a tongue Pray that he may interpret. Notice the gift of tongues that is given in this way is, is uh, to be interpreted. Why? Because it's to a prophecy, he says, is better than just speaking in tongues. If you're all speaking in tongues, nobody knows what in the world you're talking about. But if someone prophesies, it's good. For if there's no interpretation, it says they should be quiet. And the problem was in the Corinthian church, it, they were so out of control that Paul was just, so keep that in mind. They were just out of control, so he was trying to rein them in. But tongues is not abnormal. Tongues, I believe, is a normal spiritual experience for every believer who would seek God for baptism in the Holy Spirit. To, to prophesy, though, he says, is the reason for the tongue is for their interpretation, so the church might be edified. If there is no interpretation, he should be quiet. Tongues and interpretation were not meant to be an unwelcomed part of a gathering of believers. No matter if there's three, or if there's 30, or if there's 300 or 3,000, it doesn't matter. The spirit of a prophet, Paul says, is subject to the, his own control. In other words, that you don't just speak it without understanding that you can stop if it's not in the correct time. In our services on Sundays, we have times or moments where we linger and we wait. Those are welcomed opportunities, I believe, for people to prophesy and speak out. And I want to encourage you, if you feel like God has inspired you that way, to do that. And I'm not afraid of that. If you make a mistake and, and you feel like it was out of line or something, we talk, me and you talk later, and you go, Pastor, I really, I was, I, I don't be afraid of making a mistake. Amen. Right? I mean, this is a place of grace and love, and if you make a mistake, we can. if there's open correction, say, oh, that's not really from God for this moment. Don't be embarrassed. Don't quit seeking God, right? God is going to give you something by the Holy Spirit, and it comes from his word. If we don't inhale the word, we can't exhale prayer. If we don't inhale the word, we can't exhale prophecy, right? Everything is credited. The litmus test of everything is the word of God. If it, if it fails that test, then it's not the, what the Lord would have us say. And fail that test in a couple of ways. Literally, principally, where there's a principles of Scripture, like we minister all the time, there's lots of principles of Scripture, and if it has a historical precedent from Scripture, those are some really good things. But anyway, let's not get into all that, because that's for the First Corinthians series, and we're preaching ahead, right? 
Third, tongues was in this instance a physical, uh, it was a physical evidence of God's baptism of the Holy Spirit in that group. Now also, Acts 2, 4 here, also Acts 10, verse 44 to 46, and Acts 19 all have the same focus, that they, they recognized they were full of the Holy Spirit because it says they heard them speak in tongues, and a couple other places they said, and prophesy. Now, there were five instances in the book of Acts where they, spoke, where they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Three of the five, they spoke in tongues. doesn't say anything about the other two. Now, we could assume that they did, or we cannot, as the scripture says, doesn't give any indication. I don't know how they knew they were baptized or how they gave testimony, if they just had a really happy look on their face or, or they said so or what, I don't know. In Acts 8.18, it was such a powerful experience that a charlatan named Simon, who sold uh, mystical powers, offered the apostles money to have this gift, right? He saw that it was such an amazing experience. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is a powerful experience. It is for the believer. And when the believers were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, this charlatan who sold his, his mystical powers, his palm reading, his stuff, his snake oil, saw that that was such a cool thing. He's going to make money off of this deal if he could also get this power. So he said, hey, Guys, I'll give you 200 bucks if you give me this power. Right? That's what he said. Well, that's Larry Ellis. That's an LEV version, right? <laughs> right? That's an LEV right there. It's a powerful experience. Speaking in tongues has initial evidential value, but I don't believe it's the ongoing necessarily or the only ongoing gift. And the Bible says as much. Speaking in tongues in the early church, wasn't some say that was just for the birth of the church. It was like shock and awe from God, right? Shock and awe. Remember shock and awe in the war in Iraq? We're going to go in, and we're going to shock and awe on the enemy. They're going to run, and they did. But some say in our more fundamentalist circles that, hey, this was just shock and awe, the Holy Spirit's touch for the early church just to kind of get it launched. And then all of his, but the Bible never says this went away. And the scriptures never say it's supposed to. In fact, in Acts 2.39, uh, Luke writes, this promise is for all in your next generation, for all who are far off, all who the Lord will call. So I'm going to leave this here. The Bible says, and we believe the Bible. The Bible is a standard of life, faith, and conduct. All of its implications, applications, illustrations. And we always take the scripture at its word. We look at the situation. We look at the type of literature is being communicated through the Bible. We take a look at who the object of the scripture was. And we look if it was prescriptive or descriptive. The S-D-O-P, right? That's how you approach any other book. Take it at its word. The Bible has this for us. The Bible always has one interpretation but many applications don't let anybody else tell you otherwise it's just not true now there are areas that people quibble over but they're insignificant for salvation the atonement and baptism i believe in the holy spirit so tongues are not simply yesterday's church maybe when you grew up you had this vision of people speaking in tongues also jumped over the pews and swung from the chandeliers and handled rattlesnakes um, some of them do, that's true. And maybe we need a little more chandelier swingers. You know, I'm not sure. Uh, in our day today, I'm not saying that um, literally. What I mean by that is that we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it brings power and enthusiasm. It brings excitement to life. It brings a impassioned, powerful worship experience. It really does. So why don't we experience and witness tongues much these days? I think a couple of reasons. Number one, nobody preaches about it. Just the simple things I just said right here, people don't talk about it anymore. Number two, we make it so complicated, right? Secondly, people are so focused on speaking in tongues, they think it's just their own strength, their own. But Paul says the spirit of the person can regulate this. So what are we to do? We're supposed to be moved by the spirit and act accordingly. 
Paul says this, that uh, principally we, we stop and start whenever we want. So speaking in tongues isn't just gibberish. Here in Acts 2, in other places, they definitely were other languages. But in the 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 experience, they were not. They were ang- tongues of angels, right? And so there are, there's a gift of tongues, I believe, that God would have for every believer. And yours is not going to sound like mine or Jesse's or anybody else's. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sound how God puts it in you. And you might be saying, Pastor, that kind of sounds crazy and it's gibberish, but the Spirit enabled them. The Spirit enables us today. Nothing has changed. We still sing, He is the same God. He is the same God. What a great song, man. I want to jump out of the drum booth, man. I want to say. <laughs> Trying hard, though, is counterintuitive. And I want to encourage you, if you are seeking God for the gift of the Holy Spirit, don't seek tongues. Seek Jesus to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then surrender your tongue. God moves more and more when we, when we give that up. So, and, and thirdly, I think one of the things we don't hear practiced much, and they were in a room of 120 other people in this certain experience here, and, and those environments gave them permission. I want you to know you have permission here. And we're in a time of worship. And I believe, as Paul wrote, that we're not supposed to, like, hinder people with it. Like, we're not talking in tongues with God just so that we can be heard, right? I mean, that's wrong. That's sinful. I would consider that terrible. That would be wrong. Um, but today is, there's another word here called Pentecost. So let's get off of the tongue thing. Pentecost Sunday. Now, Pentecost, so we hear the word Pentecostal. So where does it come from? Well, Pentecost, pente, mean, literally means 50. So the harvest of Pentecost was a seven-week um, fruition period where the harvest would grow. Then the 49th day, seven days, they would harvest. And then the 50th, the day after, was called Pentecost. It was a huge celebration. And it was a celebration of harvest known as the, the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of the Ingathering, uh, the Feast of the Harvest. And so in Exodus 23, 16, God sets this up. He says, celebrate the feast of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in the field. Celebrate the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. So this is a celebration that God gave. God gave the celebration. God gave commissioned the celebration of Pentecost. It would be like Charles having a birthday. We're all going to go, we're going to go to the park and we're going to bring food because food is good. And Charles has a birthday and we're going to celebrate Charles' birthday because we love Charles and we're going to bring all this food and every year we're going to have this big celebration for Charles. Well, God says, I want you to celebrate the harvest, all of your labor, all of your work, your, this provision is to be celebrated with. Passover was a celebration leading the children of God out of Egypt and is celebrated eating the unleavened bread for seven days, like the children of Israel not putting yeast in the bread as an illustration so it wouldn't spoil. Pentecost is celebrated differently in the same way, some similarities, but by eating the first fruits of the harvest till their stomachs were filled. They were to eat until they were full. That full feeling like you have after Thanksgiving, you just want to sit in the chair and go, ah. Oh. And then you're reminded that there's clanging dishes and things and you are responsible to help. And you get up and do it. But Isaiah 44, 3, look at what the scripture says. Because this manifestation of the Spirit's presence is a fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 44, 3 says, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. The spirit's manifestation is a promise that is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost and to this day forward, all these years later, Pentecost. That's why they were gathered for the celebration And God poured out his spirit on their gathering. Another word that's here, seeking, actually better 
word we'll get to it later, but they were gathered together after Jesus ascended. We know they're seeking God because Jesus told them to go and wait for the promise of the Father, the gift of baptism in the Spirit. They prayed together. Now, there's really benefits of praying together, isn't there? Our prayer closets are significant. Praying alone is vital. We can't live without being prayed up all the time. That is a Christian responsibility. Wednesday nights we're, read, read, we're reading Leonard Ravenhill, Why Revival Tarries. And it's a call to prayer. It's a call to seeking God. A praying together invites the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Chronicles 6 and, 6 and chapter 7, we see the dedication of Solomon's temple. And Solomon does something. Well, the whole assembly is gathered in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And Solomon offers up this dedication, and he actually invokes the presence of God. Look at what he says. 2 Chronicles 6, 3, he says, Now, God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Now arise, O God, and come to your resting place. That's us now. And the ark of your might. May the priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your saints rejoice in your goodness. And of course, when he does this, the presence of God comes in dynamic power. There's a difference, I think, when we pray together. We're encouraged. Secondly, praying together increases the faith of a, of a congregation, of believers. How does it do that? Well, if, when I pray alone, it's wonderful. I love to meet with God. Uh, when I am faced with something and another believer prays with me or others are praying, and I hear them praying, whoo, buddy. I mean, get somebody filled with the fire of God just seeking. They can be quiet prayer. They might be boisterous and loud like me. I mean, I, some of the most powerful people that have prayed for me have been the quiet ones. God, I just pray, and you feel the anointing, like, ripping through them, right? Or they might be loud like me and just announcing God's presence. God, just thank you that you could do this. When you hear, when you have people praying with you and you're together, it encourages your faith. You, you hear them praying and they, they might, and that's why Paul writes to Timothy, you know, to lay hands on it. Laying a, when you put your hand on somebody, it, it, it's a comfort as well. It's like, you're touching them. You, you're in agreement. You're praying with them. And it encourages you when you pray together. And, and that's really important. Matthew chapter 17 and Mark 9 tell the story of a father who brought his demon-possessed uh, um, son to the disciples. They couldn't cast out the demon, remember? And so the boy was taken to Jesus. He was, he was all jacked up and he was messed up. And um, So Why? Couldn't they do this? They, they asked, why couldn't we do this? And Jesus asked them why. They said, Jesus said to them, two things. Because you lack faith. In other words, you have doubt. And secondly, this comes by prayer. In Mark 9, 29, he said, it comes by prayer. You have to be prayed up. You have to be ready. We can't just show up and, I mean, who do you want to come and visit you at the hospital? Somebody that you know has been meeting with Jesus or somebody who just got saved that morning? You want both, but you know somebody's been meeting with Jesus, they're prayed up. And the promises of God have been saturating their soul longer. They know the words to say, the steps to take, but nothing worked because there was little prayer. Little prayer, little power. Pray and not doubt, Right? Believe God for it, and as I always say, trust Him with the results because it's in His time and in His glory and for His glory. Third, there's unity. When we pray together, there's unity. Like we're trusting God for this thing. Scripture says that uh, they were together in one accord, in one mindset. In other words, of such purpose, together unified to seeking God and such power in unity. Um, beautiful. So they prayed together. The power there, right? Pentecost. Another reason, another word, a phrase here is baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is something that God tells us, or Jesus told them to go and seek him for. So the text in Acts chapter 1 verse 4 that we read is Luke writing, and he writes his from 
the same words he used in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. He says, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you be clothed with power from on high. There's, there's a lot of good stuff just that you could preach this. I mean, clothed with power, such illustration, right? But God makes a distinction between the Spirit's baptism at salvation and baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is given after we come to Christ. So there's five baptisms. There's three that are really important. Number one, baptized into salvation. So the scripture says this, the Spirit of God convicts people of sin, right? John 14 through 16, uh, the Holy, 14 and 15, the Holy Spirit convicts the unbeliever. In other words, unbelievers are meant to be miserable, yeah. Unbelievers are always under the conviction of the Holy Spirit to be saved. Those that are saved have made that step. Our conviction's different. We know that we belong to Christ, but his conviction draws us into this deeper life and walk with him that's filled with joy, peace, answer to life's issues and problems, situations, but more than that, that we are now part of the family of God. Those that don't know, have Christ but the scripture says that the Holy Spirit draws us to salvation. By one spirit we are baptized, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. By one spirit we are baptized into one body, the body of Christ. Another baptism is water baptism. The disciples baptize in water, right? As people, we baptize one another. Matthew 28, 19. Um, Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. So we're people baptized in water. And then thirdly, Jesus, the Bible says, is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. So Jesus baptizes us in the Spirit. Matthew 3.11, John said, he will baptize you, Jesus, he's referring to, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So ba baptism in the Spirit is you've accepted Jesus and He is the one that will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. We have uh, the third, another word here is power. You'll receive power. How many like power? Ugh. Why, does the whole, why does God want His people to be empowered? Well, we've heard it said that he, the Holy Spirit, gives us power to witness. And that is true, but the scripture says he will give you power and you'll be my disciples, you'll be my witnesses, right? So there is a distinct separation here, a pause, if you will. The result of having power would be that our life would be poured out and that we will be great witnesses. But first of all, that we have power. Now, power is a powerful thing. The separation is significant because it's a spirit-filled life that God is wanting to achieve in us and through us. It is power for life. In other words, the Holy Spirit so affects us that we are transformed in our hearts, our inner confidence, right? Our mind, our thinking, our attitudes, what comes out with confidence, that we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We've got to want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember that commercial years ago? It was Sprite, right? Obey your thirst. They would have, you know, people that were thirsty. They were playing basketball or whatever. And there was just this slogan, obey your thirst. Well, I believe when we are saved, genuinely saved, that we are constantly being compelled to seek God for more, to want more, to really dive in more. Like there's no in between. It's knowing Jesus, you're in or you're out, really, type of thing. So um, to obey our thirst is to pursue it, and God does something in us. There's nothing we can do to make God move. I heard people say this, God is moving. It's not the broadcaster that stopped broadcasting. It's the receiver. I contend and I've always contended that revivals come because receivers have so attuned themselves to hearing, the God, to hearing God corporately that God moves mightily among them. 
That's what happened to some people back in all the great awakenings. That a few people got ignited for God, began seeking God, began asking God for some things. And many times, God also interrupted. He said like, boom, I'm going to pour my spirit on you because you're not listening. Boom, I'm going to give those videos we showed. I'm going to give that man in Iraq who's a Muslim who can't get out a vision of Jesus so he'll come to me. Sometimes God will intervene, but usually the move of God happens because people have attuned our ears to hearing what's being broadcasted. Nobody today is going to lay their hands on you and say, go tie a bow tie, want to buy a Honda really fast, and you're baptizing the Holy Spirit. We don't make God move. We open our heart to him and say, God, you are the one who can do this. What we can do is open our lives to receive. Receiving is the hard part. So power, how are we empowered? By believing first in Jesus. There's power in salvation. The gift of salvation, the Bible says that God gives us a gift. The gift of salvation. Now, salvation comes and is given to us freely. John 1, 12, the scripture says, For as many as received him, to them he, be, he gave the right to become the children of God. Receiving is the thing. There is something to receiving. There is something to believing, that's for sure, but there's something more, in fact, to receiving. Accepting Christ as Savior means accepting him also as Lord. Now I'm following Christ. I live a seeking life. I want to be more like Jesus. I'm faithfully seeking Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I want to want what he wants. I want to reject what he doesn't want. In other words, now he is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. There's no in between with receiving the gift. There's only one position. It's like I am going to accept Christ. Some believe but never follow because the morality of Christianity is good for their life. They want to be around people with maybe a a biblical standard of morality because it's good for living, and it is. We can take the scriptures and dissect it and talk about the principles of being obedient and walking good with our finances, our tongue, and in our relationships. And we can all thrive on that kind of stuff. That's good. We ought to. The Word of God is full of those kind of suggestions, not suggestions, commands, principles to live by. It's, it's filled with them. The Word of God is what we preach here. We're supposed to preach it all the time. That's what we do. But people, some people never really receive Christ. They just want to be around those people that are acting a certain way because that level of morality is good for their life. That's how our entire society in America is built. Secondly, I think there's many more that believe but never follow Christ because they love their lifestyle and sin too much. Years ago, David Wilkerson was debating a bunch of dope-smoking people that said they were following Jesus. I don't know if you, I posted a video so while back. It was hilarious. They're saying, yeah, man, we can still do this. We love Jesus. Don't be so legalistic, man. Don't, Don't be like that. Well, following Jesus does something. It changes you. When you receive the gift, it changes you. It changes the way you look at stuff because you got the gift from somebody who's awesome. You got the gift from somebody who loves you. There's uh, some key words here in our text. Number one, wait. Because it was a gift, they didn't have to do anything. The gift wasn't given because they performed well. Because they didn't. Look at Thomas. Look at Peter. What a hothead. They waited. There's something about waiting that changes our thinking. Waiting. On the Lord. Secondly, to those who received him, he gave power. 
Well, they went and waited as God told them to, but they received him as well. Receiving is key. You see, receiving something is a powerful thing. When you have a gift to give, giving is, can be easier. Receiving someone into your home takes some preparation. You, you get your house ready. You want them to come over. You talk about what they want to talk about. You serve food that they might like. You, you make sure that they're comfortable. You do everything for receiving them. They're your guest. Receiving means receiving. I am opening up my life to Jesus and I want him to feel right at home. I want to pursue him with my life, and I'm going to do everything I can because I'm receiving him. I'm putting him right there. Receiving something is powerful, too, because giving can be a lot easier. When you receive something, you have to also give something, and that is you have to give up your pride. If I were to go down to 7-Eleven and give this to the gal who sold me my Gut Buster 3,000, 34-ounce thing, um, she'd say thank you, and she might be overjoyed for a minute, but if I give this to Jesse, because he and I have a relationship, he is my son, if I give this gift to him, he feels humbled, right? Because he knows me. There's something different there. There's a more powerful concession in receiving. To receive a gift from somebody you know is different. When you have a guest, you accommodate them. We receiving Christ means we accept the changes he might bring. Receiving Jesus means so much. And how, I, I don't know how many of you like to give. You like to give. We have givers in our church. I know we do. But receiving a gift may be a little more difficult for some. Receiving requires to give up control. Receiving requires to, to, to let that person in and have some insight into our life. I have, gifts, get, uh, I've given gifts like that to people that have a hard time receiving them. I've been one of them. Right? I, I can't take that from you. Right? Thank you, but you know, I, the principle behind this is so much bigger. God has given us Jesus. We, we are called to receive Jesus. We are called to accept Jesus and, and we're to give up control, to, to give him the space, to give him the room. We, we lay down our pride. We lay down our wants and desires because we're not just believing, but rather we're receiving him into our life. We are doing all that we can do. We are, we're not just believing. We, we are making room for him. We're making accommodations for him. We are, we are saying, God, come and have your way in me now I am receiving you like I'm receiving this gift that's why we're better givers often than receivers because we have to give up something and we we choose what we're going to give when we give but we can't choose what we're going to give when we receive we we just have to receive it and friends I contend that waiting to receive can be a stumbling block and hard for some people because we feel like there's something we have to do in order to get this gift. Like, there's got to be some exchange, right? Like, I've got to be able to perform better. I've got to look good. I've got to look right. I've got I to be so perfect. It's like salvation. I've got to get all my life straightened up before I can really follow Jesus, man. It's not like that. It's about receiving when we receive Jesus, he gives us power to become the children of God. And that is a power, the power to the counsel of his word, the, the power of belonging to his family, the power of grace, and most importantly, the power to love. Do you receive Jesus? Are you all in? Do you trust Jesus? Secondly, believe in and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So first he says, receive the gift of salvation. Now receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8, you receive power when the, get, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And, and, and Jesus says this is a gift. Receiving the Holy Spirit changes our life. The scripture says they went everywhere with the hope of Christ and subsequently since throughout the ages. 
And, and, and they were not terrified at any opposition. They stood their ground. They were persecuted and they didn't stop. Many of them were killed and it didn't stop them. They were threatened, but it didn't stop them. They were uh, um, put in various places. It didn't stop them. What was their drive? What was the significant denominational factor in all of it? They had received the Holy Spirit. They had received the Holy Spirit. They were filled with his power. Scripture says the Holy Spirit empowers us. Empowerment to, to give us wisdom from God, to be set apart for him. Power to, to come overcome strongholds in the demonic realm that are trying to devour you and your family. Uh, power to overcome the desires of your own flesh that's sometimes even more significant than the operation in the demonic world. The power to become more like Jesus every day. The power to be his witness and unafraid and unashamed of Jesus. A power. Thirdly, that power and the greatest significant factor of that power is love. John 15 through 16 says the work of the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, because it's going to get tough, these followers were going to have to love in spite of the circumstances. They were going to face persecution, rejection, hatred. The Holy Spirit's work to convict of sin, to find grace and love in Christ. Secondly, to testify about Jesus means to love. And then he says, you're going to have an advocate. That's love. You're, 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 you're going to have, to, you're going to have this man, mandate in, of righteousness from the Holy Spirit because I'm gone. That's love. You're going to, ha you're going to have a, a, a guide to lead you into all truth. I'm going to be there with you. That's love. That's the Holy Spirit saying, I am in you. I am with you. I am God. I can lead you. I can guide you. I can help you. Uh, you have a future. I'm going to reveal, he says right there in John 15. I'm going to reveal the future, and that's because I love you. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that he has purposes in all this great gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul gives him all this correction in 1 Corinthians 12. Stop, you're doing it wrong. You're being kind of ridiculous with this. And he says, hold on a second. The reason for it is love. If there's not love, if love is not the fruit of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, if you're only speaking in tongues, then just shut up altogether. He basically blasts them. Then he goes into 14 and blasts them some more. God gives us this kind of love, purpose of the Holy Spirit. Why? To love, to endure, all the world will throw at you. That's love. In the Trinity, there is perfect unity. There is love. He can speak through you. That's love. We can't speak in tongues if we're not loving. We can't prophesy if we won't edify in love. We can't give a word of knowledge without encouragement in love. We can't rebuke without restoring in love. We can't criticize without bringing hope in love. Love. Why did God baptize you or will he baptize you in the Holy Spirit? So that love will produce humility and not pride. Kindness, not curtness. Praise and not envy. Encouragement, not boasting. It will make us love our enemies. And as Jesus himself said, love one another deeply. Has God changed? No. Scripture says that he is immutable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says that God so loved that he gave. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is a power to endure through love. Love one another. Man, I need power for that one, right? There's some pretty unlovable people in this world. And sometimes I'm one of them. And yet I need to be loved and you need to be loved. We need the power to love. And I'm not talking about Huey Lewis and the news either. The power of the Holy Spirit's work and baptism seems to indicate and point all toward really expressing and being empowered with the love of God. Why baptism in the Holy Spirit? Because let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who was God, did not think it robbery to be equal with him, but made himself no reputation and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Love. Where do we find this in Pentecost? It's beyond obvious. It's God's love letter to us. You know, the scriptures where God says, I have given you everything you need for life, faith, conduct, 
You know the word of God. It's the message from Genesis to Revelation. It's the love of God. And friends, I got to tell you, when I experience baptism in the Holy Spirit, and when I am in the Holy Spirit, you got to give me a few more minutes. How many will give me five more minutes? Ready? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Gotcha. I haven't pulled that one for a while, so anyway, it worked. But from Genesis to Revelation, it's the power of Pentecost. And I hope we're seeing that today because the power of Pentecost is the presence of God's Holy Spirit in his church. We want to see God do something in Lakewood. We want to see God do something in Eatonville. We want to see God do something in your life. You want to experience that power as you walk the hallway. You, at school, Naomi, you want to see the power of God at work on display in your life. Then we get baptized with his spirit. Because the love of God is the revelation of God through Jesus and in our life. Love is the pursuit of the whole world. The whole world's looking for it. We've built institutions around this idea of love. We create our identity around love. People accept the mantra of love. Uh, you, have to, you have to, if you agree with my identity, then you're loving. If you're not, you're not loving. So the world has manufactured this idea of love that's not love because the scripture says love is not God. God is love. The reason they were in the upper room, the reason that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit was to have power to love. To receive, they were at Cornelius' house in Acts 10, 44, right in the middle of Peter's preaching, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Wow. In Ephesus in Acts 19, they received baptism by the laying on of the hands <coughs> of Paul. Right here in this altar, it wasn't that many years ago, a young Filipino gal was up here and we were praying, we were seeking God and she was filled with the Holy Spirit and she was like a, an explosion all over here. Was... And I prayed for people and they were so quiet, you could barely hear them, but man, were they filled with the Spirit? Usually it's quite noisy and that's okay. You know, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, there was no choir, there was no worship band, there was no preacher pumping them up. There was no, they were waiting. And I want to pray for us today to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you to be prepared for what God would want to do in your life. Because all of us are wanting God's love. When you feel God's presence, Pam, Terry, I don't know who's coming, would you guys come? When you sense God's presence, you get that feeling that God loves me no matter what I've done, right? It's just like all of the stuff that you know that you are that can't be possibly good, all of a sudden God's love has overshadowed that by multiple times. His love comes and, and, and it feels so welcoming and so inviting. It says, child, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've said. I don't care that attitude you displayed. I don't care what, that you got drunk last weekend. I don't care who you spent the night with last. It doesn't matter. I love you. My grace is sufficient. I want to do a work in your life that's beyond what you've ever known. I want to do something great in you. More of my love, my power than anything this world has to offer.